tämä kaikkien Praise the Lord, everybody. How many of y'all are glad to be in the house on this wonderful Wednesday night? Well, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Can we do that? I'm thankful to be here. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I was reading a scripture earlier, and it come to me as I was in the prayer room, about the middle of Daniel, chapter 11, and verse 32, and it says, But the people that know their God shall be strong, and do exploits. I'm glad there's some people in the house tonight that know their God. Amen. And I know there's going to be some signs and wonders following. There already have been. I've heard some reports this week of some miracles that God has done in some people's life. And I'm thankful for that. So just for a minute before we ask for prayer, let's just thank him for what he's already done and what he's going to do in this place tonight. Amen. Can we do that? Everybody just lift your voice for a moment. And thank the Lord and magnify him and praise him for what he's doing in this place. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, O oh Lord, for what you're doing. We magnify you and we lift you up in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. What a mighty God we serve. I'm glad to be here tonight. Do we have any needs in the house? If we do, just let them be made known by the raising of your hand. The Lord knows each and every one of them. And we're going to go before him in this place because we know here's the only one to take care of them. Amen. If we take them before him and he said, you have not because you ask not. So that's what we're fixing to do. We're going to ask him in faith believing and he's going to take care of it. So let's go before the Lord tonight. Lord Jesus, God, I magnify you and I thank you for what I feel in this place right now. I thank you for your spirit that is in this place. I thank you for the anointing, God, that is in this place right now. God, it's your anointing that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing that changes the situation, Lord. And I pray, God, that today... God, this day, not tomorrow, but this day will be the pivotal day for somebody. God, that this day they will receive their miracle. This day, God, they will understand the reason they've been going through what they've been going through. God, I pray that your will will be done in this place. I pray that your word will go forth in this place. I pray that every sickness that is in this place has to go, God. And I will give you all honor and I'll give you all praise. And I will lift up the mighty name of Jesus. For you are the only one, oh God, that is able to do all things. And we praise you, we magnify you, and we lift you up. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house tonight. It's 
Come on, can we do it in the house for just a moment? Can we pour out our praise upon him? Can we magnify him? Come on, everybody, just lift your voice for a moment. I know it's Wednesday night. We're tired. You're weary. But the Lord of King of Kings is in the house tonight. And I'm going to magnify him with everything that is within me. I'm going to bless the Lord for he's blessed me. I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, oh God. We magnify you, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You may be seated in the house this morning, or this evening, rather. I can't help but when I hear that song, pour your praise out. Brother Cody, I think of Mary when she broke the alabaster box and she poured it upon the feet of Jesus. We were talking one, one Sunday morning and I made mention to Brother Gio. I said, you know, that could be the very thing that defined her in the profession that she had. That expensive ointment that she had could have been the very defining factor that set her apart from everybody else. But at that moment, her life, her path, and everything that she had went through didn't matter anymore because she was kneeling at the feet of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when she broke the very thing that defined her, Brother David, she poured herself upon him. And the anointing fell, amen. And he said, hey, y'all might be dogging this lady. You might be making fun about what she's doing, Brother Terrence, but this story is going to be told forever. And I'm glad that the Lord sees and he knows the heart, amen. When I come into this place, I want a clean heart before him. I want to be clean before him. I want to pour my praise upon the King of kings and Lord of lords in this place tonight, amen. There's an old song that says, I didn't come, Sister Nadine, to ask you for anything. I just come to talk with you, Lord. And I'm thankful that I can enter into a place that sometimes I don't have any requests, Lord, but I just want to thank you for everything you've done in my life. I started my day off good. We had some ladies that come in and we began to talk to at first thing this morning, and one of them was going through some stuff, Brother David, so we just made a little circle right there and prayed for her. And I thought that was the coolest thing on the planet. I was like, Wow. That's how you start a day right there. Just put the Lord right in the middle of it because he said, Brother Blake, if you seek you first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things are going to be added unto you. So when you put him first in your life, everything else just kind of comes right on into play. Amen. So one more time before we take up the offering, let's just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank him for the opportunity to be in this house. Thank him for the opportunity to bless his name because he is worthy. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Amen. Sister Heidi, if you would, I'm going to put the ways to give. Many ways we can give. We give give Blafi, and I'm sure all the guys say it. This is my favorite way, and I give with that. We also have PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com, and you can send your check, cash and checks to be mailed to the Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. And then we have the wood pans for offering and the gold pans for tithing. And we're going to take it up in just a second. But right now, we're fixing to pray this prayer. And I want everybody to do it with me. Like us, we say it every time, it's not a magic prayer. But it's obedience, amen. amen. It's believing that God's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. And I know he's able because he's done it in my life, amen. So if you would pray this prayer with me tonight, upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. And I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Come tonight and give with what God has blessed you with. Praise 
Amen. You may be seated. I am so thankful that I've got an opportunity to praise him. I think about that a lot. It wasn't too long ago we was all sitting at the house watching pastors sit at his house online. And it ain't the same. But when I get to look out here and see all of your faces, it does something to me. Because you're my brothers and you're my sisters and I appreciate being in the same house with you under the same roof hearing your praises, you hearing my praises because he's a mighty God and he deserves every one of them, amen? amen. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. I don't ever want to take it for granted again every time I walk through this door that it's another opportunity to magnify him, to give him praise and glory. Tonight, if you would, the Riverbend kids, we're going to let them go back. What I'm talking about. All right, Kristen, you can lead them on back. All right, River Bend ignited. I believe Brother Tripp is going to take you back right now. Brother David, if you would, sir, would you please be making your way to the pulpit, please? Amen. I'm thankful for this man of God right here. I know I try to let him know because he does something to me. I'm, I appreciate his, his wisdom, and I appreciate the anointing that's on his life, and I'm thankful to sit under his teaching. He's a great man of God, and I appreciate him. He's my brother. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thankful for my brother, Brother David? Thank you, Brother Larry. I appreciate that. Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful that he's here tonight, Brother Blake. I'm so thankful that I can feel him, and I know that he's here tonight. You got your Bibles. I want to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm going to read the first three verses. Very familiar passage of Scripture tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. My focus tonight is going to be from the last part of that verse 3, and it says a time to build up, a time to break down and a time to build up. And I'm going to be talking tonight about broken down to be built up. Will you pray with me for just a minute? Lord, we love you. We ask you, Lord, that you would anoint your word, God. Anoint these lips of clay, God, that this word would go forth, God, and do what you intended it to do, God. I know that it will not return void, God, that it's going to speak to someone's heart tonight. It's going to speak to someone's life tonight. It's going to make a difference, Lord, in the outlook of somebody here tonight or somebody on the Internet, God. Let your word do, God, what it's intended to do, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes, the author is attributed to Solomon, Brother Shannon. And he begins with sharing his reasons or his thoughts, if you will, of viewing life as meaningless or futile. Uh, it, it was vanity is what he called it. He said it's worthless, if you will, the things that he had accomplished. He thought, or despite man's labor, his popularity, his possessions, no matter what we accumulate in life, death is going to come for all of us. Death is going to happen to all of us at one point or another. He realizes that there is a time and a season for all things, but he does not know how man, us, can fully understand when these times are relevant in our life. How can we know 
what's going to happen. This confession eventually gives way to the truth that there is no joy for us apart from the Creator. Our only joy, it comes when we're with God. When we're in tune with God and when we're walking with God and we have God in our life. That's when the union takes place, Brother Larry. That's when we're happy. It's, it's useless. It's vanity as, as Solomon calls it. He realizes the state satisfaction, meaning, and happiness do not come from what we acquire in this life. We can attain great wealth, Brother Donnie. We can get great things, but that will not bring happiness. Solomon's life proves that. He said anything that his eyes looked at, anything that he wanted, he kept not from them. He went out and he attained it. He went out and he got it. He built his house. It took him 14 years to build his house. The Queen of Sheba said the half hadn't been told about Solomon, but he says it's all vanity. It's worthless, if you will. It only comes from God. It only comes from God. A common saying in our culture, it says if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That means, Brother Blake, if it's still halfway functioning or working, then we're going to leave it alone. We're going to be satisfied with status quo, if you will. That's just the way that it's going to be. Many people live their lives the same way. Their motto, their motto is, my life is functioning. I might not be completely happening, but it, it, it's all right. And I, I'm willing to just to go along with it. I'm, I'm happy in the, in the mundane, if you will. And I got to thinking about what Brother Kevin told us Sunday morning in the Elements class. He began to think, or he began to, began to talk to us about the old voices coming back, Brother Shannon. But those old things beginning to take place. And I've had that happen in my life. I've been in church for a long time now. I've been living for God for a long time. And it seems like this last month or these last couple of weeks that I've just been hearing a voice going over in my head. Are you just tired of the monotony of life? Are you tired of the mundane of life? Do you get tired of doing the same thing day in and day out? I mean, it, 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 it really has. It's been just going over and over in my mind, and I'm thinking, yeah, at times. Just lean at times it is. I mean, I, I go to work. I go home. I go to church. You know, those are the things that I do, and sometimes life just seems it's just passing me by, and there's no happiness in it. And I know that's not the truth. But that's the lies the devil begins to speak to us. That's the lies that he begins to tell us that, hey, there's nothing in life for you. There's, there's no happiness, Brother Terrence. There's no happiness. So I'm going to live my life where I'm about halfway broken, if you will. If it's not completely fixed and I'm functioning halfway, then I'm just, I'm satisfied with the way that it's going to, I'm satisfied with the way that it's going to be. John 1 John 2 and 16 talks about three categories of sin. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and it's the pride of life. And Brother Gio and I were talking about that one time, and he called them windows to our soul, or avenues to our soul. It's through these three things that sin enter our life. Through our desire, through what we see, our vanity of life, if you will, or the pride of life, if you will, sin will enter our life. And sin will only do one thing. And that is destroy. Sin will only do one thing, and that is destroy. Harvard biologist Edward Wilson performed a rather bizarre experiment on ants. After noticing that it took ants a few days to recognize one of their nest mates has died, he determined that ants identified death by clues of smell. Not visually, as the ant's body began to decompose, the other ants would carry it out of the nest to the refuge pile, or to the ant graveyard, if you will. After many tries, Wilson narrowed down the precise chemical clue to oleic acid. If ants smelt oleic acid, they would carry out the corpse, and any other smell they would just totally ignore. Their instincts, Brother Larry, was so strong that if he dabbed oleic acid on bits of paper, then the ants would grab these bits of paper, and they would carry them out to the ant cemetery. In a final twist, Wilson painted oleic acid on the bodies of living ants. Sure enough, their nest mates seized them and marched them out with their legs wiggling and their antennas wiggling out to the cemetery, if you will, and carried them out because they smelt death on them. That was how they associated. They smelt the oleic acid on them, and they smelt death on them. Thus, deposited in their ant graveyard, the only way that the returning ants could return into the colony was to completely cleanse themselves of that smell. 
If they went back in there and they had just the slightest smell on them, they would be picked back up and they would be carried right back out of the colony again. The only way that they could totally return to the colony was to get the smell of oleic acid off of them. They had to be certifiably alive, judged solely by the smell before being accepted back into that nest. Sin for us is like oleic acid. It's the sin of death upon us. We are coated in it, and there's nothing that we ourselves can do to get rid of it. It's a stench. Our efforts to cover this stench with good works or anything else that we do is, is useless. It will fail. Sin in our lives. It's still on us. It's just a matter of time if we do not get rid of that sin, that smell of sin, that we're going to go to hell. That's rather blunt, but that's just the way it is. And there was nothing that I could do to get rid of that smell. There was nothing that I could do to get rid of it. That's how it is for us. We could not remove the stench of death from ourselves. But Jesus covered us with something else. He covered us with his blood. Something that was capable of removing the stench of death and restoring us to God. It's his blood that was shed at Calvary that gives us life. His blood shed at Calvary that gives us life. In the old shepherding communities, all would have understood this image because all knew the problem of the shepherd. He would check his flock in the morning and find a new lamb, but the mother had died during the night. In another portion of his flock, he would find a mother sitting silently beside a lamb, stillborn during the night. The mother would die of a broken heart, and the orphan would die from a lack of of milk or substance, if you will. All logic would tell us that you put the orphan under the care of the childless mother and everything would be all right. But the two would not accept each other. That's like us. We are so broken and separated from God that God is dying of a broken heart. We are dying from lack of food. We're foreigners one to another. We're foreigners from God. It seems hopeless, but the one thing that can be done is still being done by shepherds today. If you slit the throat and drain the blood of the dead baby and wash the orphan in the blood of the lamb, the living mother will smell her own blood and move around and allow that baby to suck and allow that baby to live. But she had to smell her own blood on that baby before she would allow it, Sister Crystal, to, to, to take milk. We could do nothing to remove our sin, sin from our lives or the sin is thin. The stink of death from our life. He removed it when he shed his blood at Calvary, Brother Larry. Romans 5.12 tells us, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God is what Romans 3 and 23 tells us. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit in the garden, it allowed sin to enter in. By one man's sin entered in. I started to think about this, and I, I began to realize just an enticement of what sin really can be. Can you imagine this? Adam and Eve have been placed in the Garden of Eden. Eden. They've been placed in a place of paradise, if you will. A beautiful place. There was a mist that came up out of the ground, and it watered it. It was the perfect temperature. It wasn't this 100-degree weather that we're having right now. It was, it was perfect. Imagine living in a utopia or a perfect place like that. All these beautiful animals that God had created, all these things that they could have been uh, 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 looking at, all these things that they could have been discovering on their own, the lions, the tigers, the peacock, maybe even a dinosaur. I'm not even for sure. But here's the picture I began to get as I thought about the enticement of sin. Eve could have been anywhere in that garden taking all that in, looking at all that beauty. But where do we find her? We find her by the tree that was forbidden. We find her there. There was an enticement there. There was something that lured her there. There was something that held her attention there. Brother Jerry, she was there in front of that tree. And in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, in the New Living Translation, it says the serpent was shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat 
fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It is only fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it, and if so, you will die. Now, she elaborated a little bit because if you go back and read what God told Adam, he just told Adam, he said, if you eat of it, you're going to die. He said anything about touching. He said, if you eat of it, you're going to die. So she's elaborating a little bit herself. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. It says the woman was convinced. It means her mind was changed. There was something that took place. This instruction that God had gave Adam and Adam had given to her, it, something about her changed her mind. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her, Brother Jerry. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. Now, I've always said Eve was tempted. There was a temptation that went forth. She took that fruit and she gave it to Adam, and I know that Adam knew where that fruit came from. Adam was aware of where that fruit came from, and he ate it too. He didn't hesitate about it, but it was the deceit of the enemy. It was the deceit of the devil that caused them to do that. Because of sin, human beings are fundamentally broken. Sin has a way of seducing us because it promised satisfaction and fulfillment. Outwardly, it looks good. Outwardly, it looks enticing. It looks so good, I just I want to have some of that fruit. I can imagine what Eve was thinking. It, it, it looks good. It's so powerful and it's, it's so addictive to us. But there's no lasting satisfaction. Moses said that he would rather choose to suffer the affliction of the righteous than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So it tells you there's some enjoyment there. There's some pleasures there. But he said that he'd rather enjoyment, enjoy this and suffer the affliction of the righteous. Sin enslaves us. Proverbs 5 and 22 says the evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. They bind him with ropes. But Larry, it's sin that holds him. When a person sins, they are tying themselves up instead of a sinner being free. And the Christian being in bondage because of our belief. Some people say, well, you have to live like that so you're in bondage. You can't enjoy, you can't enjoy life. And that's the farthest from the truth. I said, that is the farthest from the truth. They're the ones that are in bondage. They're the ones that, that, that have ropes around them. Sin will not allow them to see that. Every time a person sins, it becomes harder and harder to resist and yield to the temptation. You ever found that to be true? The enemy knows our weakness because why? We've sold him. We've allowed him to see what, what our weakness is. We've given him insight. The finality of sin is that it would destroy a person. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. James 1 and 14 and 15 tells, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sift when it has finished, bringeth forth death. Sin in our lives will cause us to be broken which always result in us being separated from God. And that's the desire of the enemy, Sister Eloise, is to separate us from God, to separate us from our, 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 our Savior. Psalmist David discovered this principle during his own life, through his own failures. Psalms 34 and 18 says, The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart, and he saveth such as of a contrite spirit. Psalms 51 and 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. Because of our way of thinking sometimes, we think of a broken heart or a broken spirit as being sad, being, being where we weep, being where we cry. But it's so much more than that. When you, when you look at this word, the true meaning of what David used here in this Hebrew expression, used in this verse, you, means broken. I'm just not sad, but I'm broken. There's something that's been broken in me, broken, violently separated into parts, shattered, damaged, fractured, disrupted, made weak. I've been subdued. I've been crushed. I'm bankrupt in my life. I'm disconnected and I'm not complete at all when I'm broken. And that's the revelation that David got, Brother Terrence. He realized that he truly was a broken individual. But David realized two very powerful truths. 
First, that his heart was broken, not just sad, but there was something really wrong with it. There was something really going on there that wasn't right, Brother Larry. Second, that God is attracted to brokenness. God is attracted to brokenness. Brokenness. He is nigh or near, and unto them he will not despise. There's something about us when we're broken, and things are not right in our life, and we tell God something's wrong. Something's not right. I need you in my life. There is something about that that attracts him to you, that attracts him to us. When we realize it ourselves, David knew that if it ain't broke, God wasn't going to fix it. He did not mind admitting that in his life. And that's a lot of our problem. And I'm speaking for myself. I'm not pointing fingers. A lot of times we don't want to admit when we have a problem. A lot of times we don't want to admit when we need help, and I need help from God. Pride gets in the way. Stubbornness gets in the way. And so I find myself in a vicious cycle. I'm not happy. Just like I talked about earlier. When you begin to listen to the voice of the enemy, I'm not happy. This life has nothing to offer me. So many people hear that because they do not realize they need to tell God that they need him. I need you. The only way that I'm going to make this right is with you by my side. Is with you working with me, with you taking care of me. I own that, and I, I say that to you. Psalms 31 and 2 says, I am as forgotten as a dead man out of my mind, and I'm like a broken vessel. The whole purpose of the Old Testament was to show man that he was broken, and he needed God's help. But there's a better time coming. There's a better thing that's going to happen. I'm going to switch focuses here. Sin destroys. Sin will kill us. Sin will destroy us. But God came that we might have life. And that we might have it more abundantly. He come to give us purpose in life. He come to give us a plan in life. He come to bring happiness into our life. And it's only going to come through Him. I said it's only going to come through Him. No other way. If you're unhappy tonight, if you're watching on the internet, if you're here tonight, and you're not happy at where you are in your life, try Jesus. Try God. Try Jesus. I'm telling you, it'll be the best thing that you've ever done. It'll be the greatest decision that you've ever made in your life when you choose to give it over to Him. When you choose to live for Him. The whole focal point of my lesson tonight through these illustrations that humanity has and continues to be broken by sin. And until sin's powers is broken in our life, we live under the threat of eternal destruction. I told you it's blunt, but it's either heaven or it's hell. There's no other way about it. It's either heaven or it's hell. People become broken by many things, sometimes by other people. Sometimes... Brother Cody, by our circumstances that break us, sometimes even God breaks us. But we're broken by many things in our life. Our stubborn insistence of doing things our own way and not willing to listen to God. Not willing to listen to God. The good news is that no matter how we were broken, no matter what happened to us in our life, that God's willing to fix us when we ask for his help. God's willing to fix us when we admit that we need help. Psalms 147 and 3 says, He healeth the brokenhearted, and he binded up their wounds. Luke 4 and 18, very familiar scripture, said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. The only thing that you and I need to break sometimes in our life is our pride. To break our pride and admit that we need God's help. Listen to a message by Brother Raymond Woodward, pastors in, in Canada. He got some very, very powerful messages, but I, I began to uh, watch one of his messages, and he said, pride is not really that we think too much of ourselves. Pride is not really that we think too much of ourselves, but the fact we think too much about ourselves. Good or bad, pride makes me the sinner instead of God. I'm going to read that again. Pride is not really that we think too much of ourselves, 
but the fact that we think too much about ourselves. Good or bad. Brother Woodward said, you don't just come to an altar to add God to your life. You come to an altar to break down the altars of sin that have you broken. And then you build an altar to God. He said every human being has an altar to something or someone in their lives. There's something that we all worship. There's something that's an idol in our life. Maybe that shouldn't be there. But he said they need to replace them with an altar to God. And I refer back to this message a lot of times. It made such an impact on my life. Brother Chitwood preached a message here. He said, don't let God build you an altar. You meet God on your circumstances. You don't meet God on his circumstances. You don't let God build you an altar to where something is wrong in your life. Something happens in your life. Something is tragic that happens in your life. And then you meet God at an altar there. Don't let that happen. You build God an altar. Don't let him build you an altar. That, that has stuck with me through these years, that message that he preached. I don't want God to have to do something, Sister Sharon, to get my attention. Something drastic, something, something bad. One of my children or one of my family members. I don't want that to happen, Brother Shannon. But he has a way of getting our attention. He has a way of getting our attention. When we apply the principles to our life and come to the realization that I'm broken by sin, but through death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I can begin to build something again in my life. I can be begin to build something new in my life through the power of the Holy Ghost. When I begin to think about a person beginning to make a change, we have to realize that it always begins with us allowing God to do a work in our life. Brother Gio made reference to this passage of Scripture a few services ago. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah, saying, said, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. And the vessel he made was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. It says the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. God's message to Jeremiah was twofold. He said, I want you to arise, and I want you to go down to the potter's house, and it's there I will cause thee to hear my words. A lot of times we don't hear what God tells us because we don't go where God tells us to go. Or we're not in the place that God wants us to be or in the position that God wants us to be. Jeremiah had to get up. It took some effort. It took some work on his part. He told him, I want you to arise, and I want you to go down to the potter's house. And he did by obedience. He got up and he went to the potter's house because that's the place that I'm going to speak to you, Jeremiah. It's not going to be here in your home. It's not going to be at Walmart. It's not going to be some other place. It's going to be at the potter's house that I'm going to speak my word to you. So we need to listen to what God tells us. We need to obey what he tells us. He's reaching for those that have no place else to turn. He's reaching for those that life itself has shattered and tossed them away. And they have reached a place of desperation, Brother Blake. A place of desperation. Have you ever found yourself there at a place of desperation? We all have. We're, we're, whatever it takes, I'm willing to do it because I'm at a desperate place. I'm at a desperate situation in my life. He doesn't care what our background is. He doesn't care what the color of my skin is. He doesn't care how much money I have in my pocket. He doesn't care how much money I have in my bank. He doesn't care what kind of car I drive. None of that matters to him. We're all the same in his sight. He loves all of us. He died for all of us. And he loves every one of us. It doesn't matter to him. He simply wants you. And he doesn't, he doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. He wants all of me. 
how to share a, a thought of, of this portion of Scripture. There are going to be times in our walk with God that we cannot get to the potter's house, that we have to may experience a journey through the valley of Hinnom. Now, if you study this passage of Scripture, he told him to rise and go down to the potter's house, and he had to go through what was called the valley of Hinnom. And what was there, it's, it, it's translate Guiana, if you will. It translates, translates as Hades or hell. But it was a dump. It was a place where they burnt garbage all the time. And this was the avenue that he told Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house. I need you to go down. We learn more in our valley experiences than we ever will on the mountaintop. I said we learn more in our valley experiences than in our mountaintops. When I'm walking through the valley. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's with me. He's walking with me. And sometimes I learn more when I'm in that valley than I am on the mountaintop. God's bringing me to a place where I need to go. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil and my cup running over. Surely... Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I think that is so, so awesome. I think that is so great to think that wherever my enemy's at, I'm going to be at peace. God's going to give me peace where I'm at. But Shannon, it's in the valley we learn the nature of God. It's His presence in our pain. It's his love in our loss. It's his patience despite our complaints. And it's through hardships he may have to strip us of our pride, renew our passion for him, purify us, and refine our character. That's what the fire does. That is what the fire does. At the potter's house, he found the potter working on the wheel, Sister Judy. Not a high-tech thing. The only thing that you'll find there is a lump of clay, two potters' wheel turning together, and a lump of clay on them in the potter's hand. There's nothing fancy there, Brother Larry. The first step that you and I have to take in our lives, if we've been broken, or we are broken, or we're not where we are, or not where we should be, is simply put ourselves on the potter's wheel in the hand of the potter master. I have to put my hands, I have to put him where he can put his hands on me. We cannot mold ourselves. I cannot, I cannot do this by myself because this is what will happen. Brother Shannon, if I say I can do it myself, he's going to step back and say, go ahead. You know what's going to happen to that clay? It's going to go all to pieces. Our life's going to go all to pieces. So I have to say, hey. I need your hand on my life. Oh, that pressure's not going to feel good sometimes. That pressure's going to be uncomfortable sometimes, but that pressure's what's forming us. That pressure's what's shaping us. That pressure's what's molding us into what we should be. He's the all-knowing parter. I think the hardest part of this process is that we're not willing to leave ourselves on the potter's wheel long enough. We're not willing to leave ourselves on the potter's wheel long enough. I'm saying, hey, he's done a pretty good work. I feel a whole lot better. Everything's going to be all right. I, I'm, I'm fine now. But Shannon, I, I'm fine now. I don't, really, I don't really need anything else because the process is not finished. I said the process is not finished. We're not leaving ourselves on there long enough for him to mold us and shape us into the vessel that he sees us as being. One of the points that I want to share with you, Brother Blake, sometimes it's hard for me to see what God wants of me. Sometimes it's hard to understand just actually what God desires of me. But when God has you on that potter's wheel, when God is molding you on that potter's wheel, I talked about that pressure, and he's shaping us, and he's molding us, and he's making us. While he's doing that, he sees us as a finished vessel. He already sees us as a finished vessel. He already sees what he wants to see in us. 
He already sees the desire that he has for us. A vessel to bear his name. A vessel to be used for his glory. He sees us as a finished product. Even though the process is still going on. That's how he sees us. And we have a hard time seeing that for ourselves. God told Jeremiah, he said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Jeremiah said, hey, I can't do this. Moses told him the same thing. I can't, I can't do this. But he said, before you were formed in your mother's belly, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nation. Jeremiah tells the Lord, I cannot speak. I'm as a little child. The Lord tells him he's not a child, that he's going to go and say what the Lord would tell him. Be not afraid, for I am with thee. The Bible says the Lord touched his mouth and said, I have put words in thy mouth this day. And I have put my words in this day that I set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. I believe God has a plan and a purpose for everyone here tonight. Each and every one of us that's under the sound of my voice, God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us that he wants to fulfill and that he wants to use us for. It's his desire. It's his plan. The secret to the master potter is the touch of his hand. We cannot perceive or understand God's hand in our lives and if we can't do that, we'll never see what he wants us to be. We have to understand there is a purpose. If we do not allow God to change our spirit and our nature, then it will never change our destiny. If I cannot allow him to change my nature of who I am, then it will never change my destiny of where I'm going to be going. Brother, Brother Kenzie, Brother Brian Kenzie, gave part of this message that, I, that I'm using tonight, and I will give him credit. But he said, nine times out of the ten, if you take a novice potter, or you take a novice, and you let them at the wheel, most of the time they will take their hands, Brother Shannon, and they will go down on the clay. They're trying to form it by going down on the clay, and it will never form anything that way. A master potter, and I'm speaking about the Lord himself, will always start at the bottom, and he will lift up. He will always start at the bottom to form the vessel and lift up. He will always lift us up, even when he's working the lumps out. That's why we've got to be patient with us. He wants to take out the things in our life that are hindering us, the things that are in our past, the things that I can't let go, the things that I cannot just get out of my life, my disappointments, my angers, my attitudes, my inability to forgive others. He's got to take all of that out of our lives. He's got to get all of that out of our lives. I'm just going to, I really hadn't even thought about this. And this is kind of part of my, part of my testimony. Uh, I was filled with the Holy Ghost at the age of 12 years old. God filled me with the Holy Ghost, filled my mom the same year, and uh, 1976. And my dad walked out on us December the 26th, 1976. He packed his bags. He left from a broken home. I was 12 years old. My dad walked out. My dad was always, always there. Uh, I'm not speaking ill of him because the story ends good, but he was a functioning alcoholic, if you will. I mean, he, he worked, held a job down. He, he drank uh, a, a, a lot of different things, but... I began to think about, over my life, about the things that I could have let affect me, Brother Jerry. He walked out. I didn't see him for two and a half years, Brother Shannon. Didn't see my dad. Didn't have any idea where he was at. Didn't hear from him. All of a sudden, he just kind of shows back up in our lives, you know, and there's a lot of frustration, uh, a, a lot of aggravation, uh, a lot of, uh, I guess you could even call it hate. I didn't understand at that young age, what, what I was going to have to go through, what I was facing. And one thing began to happen. Sister Sharon and I got married, and, and, and my dad became part of our lives. Sister Nadine, he became part of our lives. And there was a point to where I had to let go of all that. 
Miss Jane, I had to let go of all that. I had to get rid of all that. And uh, my dad asked me, he said, can you forgive me? I can. I, I can forgive you. I can forgive you. And, and through that, uh, God, God healed, healed a lot of things that were going on in my life, a lot of situations that were going on in my life. God healed me of a lot of, a lot of things because I was able to forgive and move on. And my dad had a good relationship uh, with us and my dad had a good relationship with my family and my kids and they got to see my dad in a different aspect and a different light than what I seen him in as, as a young man but it was through part of that he never he never received the gift of the Holy Ghost he was baptized but through that it was the Lord working in him also working in me and that's a testimony of what he can do when we, when we allow that to happen in our in our life but if we don't get rid of these things, and I said that to say this, wasn't intending to do that, but we've got to get rid of that stuff. We've got to get rid of those things, that hurt, that anger, that disappointment. We've got to get rid of that and get that out of our life. Get it, get it out of our life. There's a song called Bring Christ Your Broken Life, and it says, Bring Christ your broken life so marred by sin, and he will create a new, he will make whole again. Your empty, wasted years, he will restore. And your iniquities, remember no more. Bring Christ your broken heart. The greatest demonstration of God's power throughout the scripture is how God salvages broken, helpless lives. Broken, helpless lives. <coughs> I'm getting ready to close. I'm going to leave you with this. We have to trust the process of the potter. The keys to rebuilding or allowing God to rebuild our lives is acknowledge that I'm broken. Requires complete surrender. I have to submit my will to the will of God. I've got to have faith in God that he's going to take care of all of it. And I've got to allow God to do the work and direct me or direct the rebuilding in my life and allow him to be able to do that. We've got to trust the process of the potter. Because he's molding us into a vessel of honor. There's going to be times when we go through the fire to become what the Lord wants us to be. Sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes the heat's not going to be... It's going to be painful. Because the clay has to be put through the fire. And sometimes even the fire causes a crack in the vessel. So when you begin to study that, you begin to look at that, the potter goes, gets an insect called a fasuka. It's a tick. And he takes the blood from that tick and he mixes it with powdered pottery and he applies it to the cra crack in the, in the vessel. And he refires the vessel into the furnace. And there's a transformation that takes place because after the vessel comes out of the fire, you cannot find the crack in it anywhere. The blood of Jesus Christ is still, filling, is still fixing the broken today. It's still making us into a new vessel today. John 1 and 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all from sin. Will you stand with me? I'm going to leave you with four more points. So thankful for what God's done. I hope this is spoken to someone tonight. I couldn't get away from it, kept coming back to it. There was things that were said. Sister Kim had shared a post on Facebook that kind of went along with this. I want to leave you with four facts about the pot, matter, pot, master potter. The potter knows the origin of the clay. The potter knows the nature of the clay. And the potter knows what's best for the clay. And the potter knows how to properly handle the clay. But we've got to trust the process. We've got to trust the process. Amen. Is it, do we have any announcements? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this bullets in here for a minute. Anything that anybody knows of? Brother Gio is with the youth group in Pigeon Forge. I'm sure they're having a, a good time tonight at the Elevation Conference. I bet you wish you could have been there, Brother Blake. It would have been a good time. We have, I'm trying to trying to see this there is going to be we got an evangelist coming up don't we august the 22nd 
Reverend Tim Bizzle will be preaching for us August the 22nd, and we don't want to forget about that. We don't want to forget about this weekend. Looking forward to what God's going to do on Sunday. Looking forward to what he's going to continue to do. Brother Larry, dismiss us in prayer tonight, brother.